<clears throat> well, welcome again this evening. We're thankful for a uh, great crowd again tonight. Some, some kids here. I'm excited that you're here tonight. I want to start off with a story about my kids, Avery and Brooks. <clears throat> Excuse me. When they were about this age right here, probably about six and nine, five and eight, uh, they were having a race. All right, they're getting out of the grocery store and they decided to have this race to the car. And they did this a lot. They loved to, to race and compete with one another. How many of you guys have ever done that, had a race with your sibling? Yes. Well, my son Brooks, who was probably six at the time, he made it to the car first. All right? But Avery, my daughter, got her seatbelt on first. All right? So who's the winner there? They're going back and forth, back and forth. I won. No, I won. I'm the winner. And then they finally try to get me in this, all right? I'm the, I'm the referee in this, uh, this debate. And I said, no, I'm not getting into this, all right? And so they're going back and forth. Dad, who won, all right? And I said, it doesn't matter. This is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous argument. It doesn't matter. And uh, it didn't suffice. And so they kept arguing. And I finally said, just say. Just say the words. It doesn't matter. They could not say it. It doesn't matter. I could not say it. And I finally said, because it just kept on going, I finally said, all right, unless you say it doesn't matter, you both lose. <laughs> Silence. Silence. <laughs> finally, my son Brooks goes, uh, it doesn't matter. And then Avery, she didn't want to lose either, so she said, it doesn't matter. And I kid you not, the next words out of my son's mouth were these. I said it first. <laughs> Our argument started all over again. Well, I like to think that those races don't matter, but really, sometimes they, they do matter. God put a competitive spirit inside of each one of us for a reason. And we can use that competitive spirit for good or for evil, for God's glory or for our glory. And we've been talking about how we want to run that race with victory in mind. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, that is the way we are going to find victory in this world. We think a lot of times that this world is the scoreboard, but that scoreboard lies in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I'm really excited tonight. <clears throat> We're going to be starting going a little bit different direction, talking about the church and how we need to work together. And so uh, I asked Wayne to, if, hey, invite some kids. I got I got some fun things. I, I got some Legos, all right, to go along with the sermon, and I'm going to let these kids play with these Legos during the message, if that's all right. Would you guys want to play with some Legos? You guys like Legos? All right. Well, come on up here. All the kids can come on up here and get some Legos, all right? Let's see here. All right. Here's a, here's a yellow one for you. Okay, have fun. All right. Here's an orange one, all right? All right, there, oh, another yellow one. All right, have fun with that Lego. All right, there you go. There's an orange one. Oh, yes, all right. Here you go. There's another orange one and a yellow one. And I'm not even sure what type. Oh, here's a, here's a real small one. All right, just have a good time with that Lego right there. All right? Now they're going to have so much fun with those Legos. All right, and they're one's already borrow one from the other, all right? They know, listen, they know. Legos, Legos were not meant to be played one at a time, were they? In fact, there's no fun just to have one Lego. In fact, they can be very dangerous if you lose that one Lego and you step on it. Everyone that's had kids with Legos has stepped out of Lego, and they can, they're like landmines, all right? They're very dangerous. Legos were created, listen up, to work together. And when we put them together, when we put Legos together with purpose, all right, and a plan, all of a sudden they can create something beautiful, something extraordinary. And, and, and whenever those things come together, and, and we're the same way, when God created the world and everything in it, remember the story of creation? Whenever he made the sun and the moon and the stars, whenever he made the birds, 
of the air, and the fish of the sea, and the animals of the land, after every single day, he said it was good. There was only one time that he didn't say it was good. In Genesis 2.18, it said the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. When he created man, he said there is something missing. There is something missing. The truth is this, that we were made for communities. We were made for one another. Now, I am not that mean that I would just give each kid one Lego here, all right? And so I got, I, I do want you to come play with Legos, so come on up here, and you guys can actually get a bag of Legos. Does that sound good? All right? And I want you guys to create something really special during the message, all right? So people can go along with what I'm talking about tonight, too. All right? And thank you, Wayne, for getting that together. Oh, look at this. we got the perfect amount. Good job. All right, so we'll see who can create something special during the, during the message, all right? Now, <clears throat> losing my voice here. I'm not used to preaching every single night here. Christianity, as you know, is both a private discipline and a shared experience. I don't know if you realize that there's 59 times in, in the Bible where it talks about the one another command. 59 times, it barked not, I won't go through all of them, but it says to be at peace with one another. In John 13, it says love one another. In Galatians 5, it says serve one another in love. In Galatians 6, it says carry one another's burdens. In James, it says pray for one another. In Romans, it tells us to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. In Romans 12, it says honor one another above yourselves. In Hebrews, it says, encourage one another daily. In Ephesians 4, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another. In Ephesians 4, it says, forgive one another. In Romans 15, it says, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you. And in 1 Corinthians 16, it tells us to greet one another with a holy kiss. Maybe that was a cultural thing at the time. I know that I didn't grow up kissing everyone going to church. But if you would go out, I married an Italian woman from New Jersey. And it was very cultural in their family to kiss one another. And so whenever I went out there to meet her family for the first time, everyone was kissing one another. And I didn't think it was too bad. She had some good-looking sisters and cousins. That wasn't too bad, all right? But then I realized that I had to kiss her dad. And I thought, oh, man, I don't know about this kissing one another thing. There is no doubt in God's kingdom, though, that we are to do life together, unified by love. I love what Andy's family writes. He says this, the primary activity of the church was one another and one another. There isn't a lone ranger in the kingdom of God, or at least there should not be. One another, one another is something that we should be doing daily and living out. Christianity is absolutely a team sport. Following Christ is a team sport. Jesus knew the principle of synergy. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And together, everyone achieves more. We are at our best whenever we're working together. Fulfilling the mission of the church is absolutely a team sport. It's not the great mission we talked about this not the great mission, but rather the co-mission. Together we can go out and make disciples. Together we can teach others all, teach others all of God's commands. Together we can go out and baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that the church is God's plan A for reaching a lost and dying world. And there really is no plan B. We are his plan to reach this lost and dying world. And it's the only way that we will find victory. Finding victory in Christ Jesus is a team sport. I mean, you can do this Christianity thing on your own. You can follow Christ on your own. But you're really going to have to gloss over much of the New Testament. 59 times again. It says in the New Testament, in one way or another, 
to love one another, to be kind to one another, to serve one another. We should absolutely have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but following Him will lead us to one another 100% of the time. And not only to one another, but to others in this world. And I can see, I can see in my mind how it would be so much simpler to practice my faith on my own, in my own little bubble with the people that I know, the people that I'm comfortable with, our so-called holy huddle. It's just safer, it's easier, it's less stressful. It's just not what I see in Scripture telling us to do or how to live. In fact, if I look through the Scripture, it's, it's the exact opposite. Now, I love the game of football. I imagine some of you enjoy football as well. Sometimes watching the Hawkeyes or the Cyclones is not the easiest thing to do. But I can imagine if Jesus was the quarterback, Iowa would absolutely love Jesus as a quarterback after the past few years. I can imagine Jesus getting us all together in the huddle. And he's calling the play. It's like, all right, boys, here's what we're going to run. I want you to go across the middle. I want you to go deep. And big guys up front, give me some time because we're scoring on this play. All right, ready, break. And everyone just stays there, silent. And they're like, boy, uh, Jesus, um, boy, that play sounds kind of risky, doesn't it? Did, he, did you see that guy that I had to block last night? He's a big boy. He was kind of not so nice to me. He was calling me names. And, and I don't really want to go out there and do that. And, and yeah, I don't want to go across the middle. Last time I did that, man, I got hurt. That was painful. I'm not going across the middle again. And, and yeah, I'm not going deep. Man, I'm, I'm pretty tired. You know, it's been a, it's been a long game. I, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to sit this one, this one out. And, and they're like, Jesus, how about this? How about we just stay in the huddle and we'll just talk about what it would look like if we ran that play. It sounds like a good play, but we'll just talk about what that would, what that would look like. I can't imagine, I can't imagine that Jesus as our captain and our quarterback and that would fly with him. Because over and over and over again, God tells us that he created us for a purpose. He wants us to get in the game. To do good works. To go and make disciples. To be his witnesses. To be his ambassadors. And he tells us that we are all the body and each one of us has a part in it. It is God's plan for your life. And why? Because following Christ is a team sport. We need each other. There is power in the body of Christ. We are so much better together. When God's people are unified in one mind and one voice, beautiful things happen. People start to experience God's kingdom here on earth, and that is irresistible. And God's kingdom grows and today, as we get into this one another command and find victory in one another, keep in mind that these aren't just good suggestions, but rather that the church, the body of Christ, suffers whenever we don't follow through with, with our part in this kingdom work. We're going to be looking at Romans 15, 5 through 9. And the background to Paul writing Romans is this, the mid it's the mid-50s A.D., the church is about 20 years old at this time, and many scholars believe that there were Romans that were there on the day of Pentecost, all right? They were in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost. They were part of the 3,000 that were baptized into Christ, and they, were going, they went back to Rome to start the church. And you talk about the first Christian church there was many there, all right, there, there that day. Paul was planning a trip to Rome when he, when he wrote this letter to the church in Rome. And the church had grown significantly. And they were dealing with persecution, but they were also dealing with conflict. Rome was the epicenter of the Mediterranean world and at the height of the Roman Empire. And they had a very ethnically diverse population in Rome of about a million people. 
And in his letter to the church in Rome, he had, to, he had just addressed a couple divisive issues that they were dealing with. And he basically tells them, hey, stop judging each other on these secondary, secondary matters of religious practice about food and about holy days because it's dividing the church. Paul is talking to these committed disciples and he tells them to focus on peace, encouragement, to focus on avoiding these quarrels. And, and you can read all about that in chapter 14. But in Romans 15, 5, Paul writes this. He says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, he's telling these people, Roman Christians, he's saying, I get it. I know it's not easy. You're going to need God absolutely in these matters. You're going to need Him to be of one mind and of one voice. It's Him who's going to give you endurance and encouragement. You're going to need it. But remember what we're after here. Remember what we're after here. We're after giving God glory with our lives and doing that together. And here's how you're going to do it. Just remember what Jesus has done for you. Keep your eyes fixed and focused on Him. The author and perfecter of our faith. I should have brought my cross eyes. Be a great illustration right now. And he says this in verse 7. In verse 7 it says this. It says, accept one another just as, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. And if we want to be of one mind and of one voice, if the church is going to function as the body of Christ, and we're going to bring glory to God, then we need to absolutely, according to verse 7, accept one another. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. And the answer is this. Yes, even that person. Even, don't look at them, all right? Don't look at them. Don't look at them. <laughs> the verse is saying this. It isn't saying what we need to... It, it, it isn't saying that we need to learn to just tolerate that person. And I know that there is value in that, absolutely. But it goes so much further, further than that. The word for accept in the Greek is the word prosmobon. And I may have butchered that. Is there any Greek scholars in here? Alright, I, I nailed it. I nailed it. <laughs> and that prosmobon means this. To receive wholeheartedly, to warmly welcome to yourself, or to grant admission into your heart to look beyond anything supervision, superficial and to be willing to build, to open and willing and open to build relationships. And that definitely adds a little weight to that passage, a little weight to that word, accept one another. But I know that we can talk until we're blue in the face about what that looks like. But the words that follow that command are all that we really need because the words that follow that command are this. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Now what does accept one another look like? What kind of weight does those, do those words hold now? Just as Christ accepted you. And there are so many good examples of Christ's acceptance but we're going to turn to Luke 5, 27 through 32. And then in this passage, it's how Jesus calls Levi the tax collector and eats with sinners. And I love how Max Lucado, we were just talking about Max Lucado, how Max Lucado kind of gives a story or a preamble by introducing Levi this way. All right, so Luke 5, 27 through 32 will be there in a couple of minutes, and Max Lucado shares this story, and I really love um, just how it describes uh, Levi at the time and Jesus' acceptance of him. 
says, in a land far away, but not much different than our own, there was a tidy, well-manicured neighborhood. They kept the streets clean and the lawns trim and the standards high. They had in each household two kids and two parents and a dog or a cat. They had a goldfish bowl that each contained a goldfish. They walked their dogs each day and they waved at the mailman and all of them turned their lights out by 10 p.m. It was a quiet existence. Then their lives were turned upside down. You see, there was a man that bought a house on the corner of Oak and Elm. A man. Not a family, not a couple, but a single man named Levi. Levi, as it turns out, drove a Corvette, and he liked to drive it souped up with the top down. Levi installed a pool and a deck and an oversized outdoor speaker system. And as the sweet neighborhood was winding it down, Levi was cranking it up. He was known to have some epic parties. His friends came from the other side of the tracks and they drove jacked up trucks and low riding caddies. They wore tight jeans and low cut tops. All talked way too loud, drank way too much, and stayed up way too late into the night. So when the fine people in the fine neighborhood on Sunday morning would begin their drive to church, they would look at their lawn, look at the lawn of their new neighbor and all the cans and trash that littered the front yard, and they would turn around to their kids and say, that man needs Jesus. And so Jesus came, literally. Jesus came into the neighborhood in the flesh. Jesus came and walked the streets of the nice neighborhood. He went door to door looking for someone he could just have a conversation with looking for someone he could grill a hamburger with, looking for someone just to go out golfing with. Lucado, um, but everyone was, was busy. They were busy with their curfews, busy with their carpools, busy with their kids. They had a lot of responsibilities. Everyone was too busy for Jesus, except for the man in the house on the corner of Oak and Elm. Except for Levi. In fact, Levi and Jesus just hit it off. They laughed, they talked, they discussed life. And eventually, Levi told Jesus about his sketchy past. Levi would listen as Jesus would talk about forgiveness and about the future. Levi was like, whoa, you mean even for someone like me? And Jesus would just smile and look at him and say, Levi, especially for people like you. And then one day, Jesus came, kind of been on a special visit with a special invitation. In Luke chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus said, Levi, follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi, in verse 29, said, said Levi, then Levi held a great banquet, an epic party for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And my friends... That is what it looks like to accept one another. And I pray that 10 out of 10 times the church feels more like a banquet for sinners than a country club for the righteous. But 10 out of 10 times we are the Levites who understand our need, our need for grace, than the, than the religious leaders who could only find faults. Those religious leaders were called Pharisees in that day, which comes from the old Hebrew word meaning one who is separated. Their whole view of religion was this, was to separate, stay away, quarantine, and they would have been perfect for the pandemic one day. I mean, their whole theology was that good people, God's people, don't mix with bad people. It was at the core of who they were. And, when, and, and you can see why they struggled with Jesus when he said, 
in Matthew 5, and I love that it's Levi, also known as Matthew, who wrote in his gospel these words. I'm sure that for Levi, it resonated when Jesus spoke these words. In Matthew 5, it says, You have heard it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Our lives and our view of this world need to be ruled by love, and our response to this world needs to be led by grace. And here's the crux of the issue. Where we as Christians, we can struggle so much because there is a difficult balance here. What about sin? What about sin? We cannot accept sin, can we? And the answer is this, no. Absolutely not. We must take a stand for the, for the truth and what is right, what God's word said is the best way. But understand this, the world and God's kingdom do not have the same standards, the same truths. The world never has operated with the same truths, nor will they ever. So those whose identity in this world, we cannot expect to live by the truth of God's kingdom. If their identity is in their money, then their theology will be whatever will bring them more money. If their identity is in their occupation, then their theology will be whatever helps them climb that ladder of success. If their identity is in their politics, then their theology will be whatever can win them at the polls. If their identity is in their sexuality, then their theology will be whatever brings them satisfaction. And whatever the identity crisis this world is dealing with, in the end, they're all futile pursuits. And the results will always be hopelessness and conflict. And the answer to hopelessness and conflict is God's amazing grace. The answer is Jesus. The answer was Jesus. The answer is Jesus. And the answer will always be Jesus. And if our identity is in Jesus Christ, then our theology is, should be all about bringing Him glory and Him honor. And God desires for unity to happen amongst His people, His children. He desires love and acceptance, which always begins with grace and is always followed up by truth. We should absolutely value both grace and truth. All grace and no truth, well, that deceives. It would be ridiculous to say no worries. Everyone can have their own truth. It will be fine. Jesus loves everyone. No, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one will come to the Father except through me. But all truth and no grace destroys if we leave out grace, we have missed the whole point. It's the whole message of the gospel. It's the whole reason that Jesus came. We all need His grace, absolutely. There's always error in one without the other. We need both. In John 1, 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The challenge really has been set. The way I read scripture, the one another that you are to accept is precisely the one that is different from you. It may be your neighbor, it may be a co-worker, it may be a family member, but whoever it is, I want you to know that there will be blessing on the other side of your unconditional love and acceptance. You you see, God created each one of us with a need to be loved and accepted. And God created the church to be a place where love and acceptance reigns supreme. 
when love and acceptance and forgiveness prevail in the church, then it becomes what Jesus was and is, and it starts to look and feel like, like Jesus, and it becomes a place where the hurting people, where hurting people can come and be healed and transformed. And that is what this lost and dying world absolutely needs right now. That is what Marshall County needs right now. That is what Liscom needs right now. That's what we'll always need is his love and acceptance. It's a political year, I understand, and there is much division in our country. There's much hate, there's much hurt, there's idolatry and immorality. Our country definitely is going through an identity crisis. And we're no longer a country that lives by the creed in God we trust or under a nation under God, but rather the opposite of in man we trust. And what this country needs is for the church to be the church. For us to unconditionally show that love and acceptance to this world. And we were made for that. We were made for one another. And when we come together, there is absolutely power in the body of Christ. <coughs> and I'm calling today for everyone to, boy, we need each other as well. And together, we can find that victory. And it's a victory that does matter. It absolutely does matter. If that's you and you need to make a decision tonight, you want to accept that victory tonight, we're going to sing something very appropriate, 290. Victory in Jesus. Let's stand and let's sing.